Marcus, how's the trade? How's the trade going, dude? Trade's going excellent. Bitcoin number goes up only, never selling. Yes, Bitcoin stack. <laughs> we, need to, we need to come up with like a different intro joke, uh, Sean. <laughs> what? Nope, this is the, it's the same old one because we get it all the time. So I'm going to keep going with it. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Bitcoiner's Guide, the show we wish we would have had when we first started learning about Bitcoin. So we made it for you. We're your host, Big Sean Harris and Plan Marcus. To timestamp and price stamp. Today is Monday, May 16th, currently 2.58 p.m. in the Mountain Standard Time. Bitcoin's price is $29,821, so down about 3.75% in the last 24 hours. <laughs> Bitcoin's been doing this whole thing, uh, and... Uh, before we're, we're going to get have a Bitcoiners guide tip of the week. I was telling this story to Marcus uh, before we even got on. And he was like, dude, just tell it on, on the, on the show. So I was like, all right. So I was telling him, I, I was hanging out with some buddies this weekend and, uh, and a lot of them know, you know, that I, that I uh, have Bitcoin that I, that we talk about Bitcoin a ton. I'm always on Twitter and stuff and doing things with Bitcoin. And so as soon as I got there, a couple of these guys, they just started asking me questions about Bitcoin, but you're in a room with like 15 guys. And so it's a little hard to explain everything when you have questions coming from all angles. So I was just kind of trying to play it easy, not go too deep, uh, especially when you got a bunch of people around you, which I don't know if that's the right strategy, it just seemed like it was hard if there's a lot of questions coming that no one would get an answer, you know, but when it ended up being, was what I was going to tell them was everyone then just start asking, well, what's, well, what's the next best crypto is what they would say. And I'm like there. And I was like, Oh, I wish I just had the sailor video with me or this picture of sailor when he's just like, there is no second best. <laughs> and I said that I literally said there is no second best at least eight times over the weekend. And by the end of the weekend, everyone knew that that was going to be my answer. And like, they would just say it and then they would joke back. Like there is no second best before even I could say it. So if anything, uh, that after that happened, you know, those guys were, they learned one thing that there's no second best that it's just Bitcoin, not crypto. So <laughs> that was, that was what, that was how my weekend went. Uh, so what, 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 what made them so excited or so curious to want to ask you questions? Was it because of the price drop that they felt like now is a good time to buy? Or was it just because they saw you and they know you have like uh, backed up the truck into Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a little bit of both. Some of the guys, they have a little bit of Bitcoin I don't know how much, you know, they're definitely not all in. It's probably not even 1% of what they have. You know, they probably just bought a little bit to watch it. And uh, one guy was like, man, this is so hard to, he's like, talk me off the edge. I'm thinking about, you know, selling right now. And I was like, dude, this is the best time to buy. <laughs> this is like, it, this is when you want to buy is when the dips just hit super hard. But then like we've watched this and been around for a long time. Um, like I've been watching Bitcoin closely since 2017 and, you know, I didn't buy till 2019 and I'm mad that I didn't buy till 20. I wish I would have bought at the 2018 bottom. And so it's like, I'm don't, I'm not going to make those same mistakes again. Like in this time around, when it's hitting the bottom, and I'm going to have the same conviction and, and emanate that same conviction towards anyone I talk to. And it's just funny when, you know, when there's blood in the streets is the whole saying, like, if, if the price in dollars is down, some people are freaking out, but there were other guys too, that were like, well, what's going on? And they were just checking, like, is it dead? Like, is it dead? Because I would want to buy this if it's not dead. And I'm like, yeah, it's not dead. There's, you know, everything keeps expanding. Uh, there, there's so many good things about Bitcoin's underlying fundamentals. 
and uh and those aren't going away so i think it was just some people wanted reassurance and other people wanted to get talked off the ledge so it's a little bit of both but yes it yeah. was just watching the price drop and that's what made a lot of people talk about it got it yeah it's hard it's hard man especially yeah i i, I run into the same things um i actually had a friend of mine who i talked into uh into bitcoin back in 2019 he mentioned to me over the weekend that he sold his initial uh, position. Um, so what he put in, he took back out and he left uh, his profits in. And uh, that's what it is. And I guess it was because of the price action as well. You know, once the price starts rolling back, people get nervous and it's no fun watching your, you know, most people still look at their fiat number. And when they see that rolling back or coming down, then they, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah. Cause they feel like they're like, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to see it go up than to watch it go down in any case. And then, yeah, then you get nervous. You, you, you get unsure and, um, yeah, to cut the losses, you, uh, you cut it, but yeah, usually too late because you probably already watch it go down 50%. And then, you know, to, to cut it loose after it's already dropped more than 50%. Sure, it could drop another 50%. It could drop another 90%. Who knows, yeah. right? I mean, it has <laughs> been pretty wild lately. But um, yeah, think, uh, think again, yeah, uh, yeah, 90%, I don't see it happening, just, just to be clear. But um it's yeah it's tough it's tough so people will will sell people will freak out and that's when we hit the exact bottom you know because at one point there's no you know everybody who's scared has sold their bitcoin yeah that means the rest is now all in 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 cold storage and not planning to move for a long time unless the price goes way up and then that's when the shortage kicks in and the price starts running up again and trust me all these big institutions you know and there's so much talk about this ETF now uh, coming, you know, and like Sailor keeps talking about it as well, how he sees it's actually really positive, how the SEC is responding to like how they didn't outright uh, dismiss or deny the, the latest ETF request. And they actually asked for a round of uh, comments from, from investors to comment on a uh, possible ETF. So Sailor said, well, this is different from the other applications. So this is, looks like they're actually going to have to move forward with this now. So if that's the case, you know, then um, there's going to be a lot of buying going on at these levels to probably even front run that. Who knows? Yeah, I think, Dude, I'm, I think just, all these... I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to stack, especially like under 30K again. I honestly thought we weren't going to go under 30K again. <laughs> Me neither. Um, we're, we're still under it. We seem to have like a little trouble breaking above it now, actually. So that's kind of interesting to watch. But uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be here long. And uh, by the time, you know, we were just mentioning this earlier in two or, or three or four years, we're going to be somewhere at like 200 or 300 K. And we're going to be like, oh, my God. Remember, we were able to buy below 30 K just a couple of years ago. So don't even overthink it, you know, whether it's uh, 28. 22, 15, 30, 40, just, yeah, just yeah, just try to stack every month, you know, when you have some extra money coming in or you can save some money somewhere, just put it away. Don't touch it for at least four years. Yeah. I think uh, I have, I had a friend too, like your friend you were saying earlier, who he, he bought around, like I helped him get his first buy in like around $10,000 when Bitcoin is at that price. And he was like, okay, when it doubles and it goes to 20K, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell half, get my money back that I put into it, and then just have this infinite return, basically, was his idea. And then uh, the price started pumping. And then he he was like, I can't sell. And he started buying more. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what happens to most of us. Uh yeah. But if you don't understand the fundamentals or if you don't have like a good idea around it, yeah, then when the price crashes, you're going to have the same thought of, okay, well, I'm just going to sell the amount that I put in because all you're looking at is the chart and it's more than just the gains. Like, yes, NGU, number go up technology is very important, but it's not important in the short term. 
uh, it will play out in the long run. It always has, it always will. And uh, you can be sure of that because they, that we got the crack addict printing, printing trillions of dollars every year, which is the federal reserve. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the big air term <laughs> that's going at play. Um, so let's switch gears and get into the Bitcoiners guide tip of the week, which is presented by mfmerch.com. The best merch in Bitcoin. Uh, this week's Bitcoiners guide tip of the week, we wanted to talk about, we were also talking about earlier how to exit the hamster wheel. And Marcus had some really good thoughts. And I just wanted to kind of hear how you, how you thought about, you know, how do you think about exiting the hamster wheel? Like, why is any of this, why is money even important to learn about in the first place? Oh, yeah, big, uh, big questions there. Uh, I think it, <laughs> I think most of us are stuck in a hamster wheel or have been stuck in a hamster wheel. And honestly, I think most of us are. I mean, there's obviously Bitcoiners who got in uh, early and they'll they'll be able to, you know, like live more of the life <laughs> or spend the time more the way they want to. Looking at you, Sean, you're, uh, you're a pro basketball player. I think a lot of people look at pro basketball players and think like, wow, that's, that's definitely a life I would want to, to live, you know, like, get to play ball, get to go to the gym, I get to eat right and I'll get paid for it as my job. Sounds like a, sounds like a super deal, super good deal to me. To be honest, I remember I wanted to be a pro tennis player when I was uh, a teenager. Yeah. And that didn't work out, obviously. <laughs> but uh, we don't know. Yeah, so we don't when know. you, you know, when you, when you hit, like when you come out of high school and in my case, I went to university and then you come out of university, you get your first job and then you realize, whoa, uh, this is hard work and I got a lot of competition, right? Because there's a lot of other people like me all competing for that better job and that raise and that, that higher up position. So yeah. you start slaving away at your job five days a week for, for, you know, not a lot of pay, you know, you're like, okay, this is all sacrifices I'm making. You know, I just got to prove my worth now. I got to, you know, like show what I'm capable of and I'll get ahead that way. And like, I'm, I'm 42 now and it's like, yeah, at, at a certain point, you know, also when you get children, at least in my case, you start thinking a little bit different, you know, you just don't want to sacrifice every weekend or every evening anymore. You actually want to try to spend some more time, you know, with family and maybe you start changing uh, priorities a little bit, you know, like at what point do you still want to get ahead as much as they just want more free time to spend, you know, with, with loved ones or, or doing the, the stuff you, you love and really care about. But anyway, you know, in uh, um, sorry, <laughs> I kind of got lost in my in my, in my <laughs> thought there. the The thing is, we are all looking for a way uh, to bring pension forward, I guess, or retirement forward. You know, mm -hmm. we would all love to retire before fortieth or before fiftieth or whatever your number is, depending on your age, of course. You know. I, don't know how, how old our listeners are over here probably mostly between like 25 and, and 45 i would guess but um yeah so most people are in their job you know working away and making just enough money to get through the month to pay the bills maybe to get a new pair of shoes or to go on that little, little, little trip or to, you know, to take your, to take your girl out to a nice place or whatever. And then at the end of the month, you're always confronted with, oh, there's still like so many days left in the month and I've only got so much money left. And it seems sometimes it can be really daunting. Like, will you ever get out of this rat race? You know, like, yes. will you ever be able to save up money, especially with like prices going up so hard and you look at the price of houses, how can I ever pay down my my mortgage, you know, let alone by the time when my son or my daughter or whoever, you know, gets uh, gets old enough to go to college and you want to put them through college or maybe help them out with, uh, you know, it can be daunting. And to be yes. honest, you know, I was always I was always really good in school. I was usually somewhere at the top of my class. So I grew up pretty confident in my ability. but when I think about like 
the competition and how much work and struggle you got to put in to just get that basic peace of mind. Uh, what is it like for people who are less confident, you know, and maybe like at the lower end of their class, like it seems it must feel like a hopeless and daunting task to ever get like a decent pension. And that's, that's kind of what Bitcoin really fixes, right? Because yeah, let me, let me hand it over to you from there. Yeah, I, I think you, I totally agree, right? You're saying it could be daunting. Like I've definitely been in that position where you can't, you feel like you can't leave the hamster wheel. Like everything just goes, your head's down, you're just working and you feel like you can't look up, you can't, you know, it, it just it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders because you can't get through it all. And I've been there, I've been in positions where I've made money and then I spend all the money that I make and I have nothing left over. And when you do that for a while, which is living paycheck to paycheck, essentially, you like that's what made me study money because I was I was just so far down this road of, okay, well, if I do this my whole life, am I really ever going to enjoy life or am I just going to work until the day that I die? And it can be crushing um, even and you can feel like you're doing all the right things. And it can still crush you because of inflation. And I think that's what really opened my eyes was you can go to school, graduate from college, get, get a degree, get a get a, the job and not like the job, you know, not like your boss, not like being told what to do uh, and still just barely scrape by. So then the question is like, well, then how do you even invest or how do you, what, what, what do you do at that point? And I think the biggest things that I learned, and you know, and I started reading a lot, I started studying money. As I studied money, uh, money became easier for me to save, which was just like a natural thing. I don't know why, but it became a lot easier be, for me to save because I realized my goals had to be a lot higher, uh, the, especially than the goals of the people that were around me. And, I, and so it changed my way of thinking. And I think that just like three simple things were, okay, well, first of all, you have to make money. Then you have to save the money. Like you have to save some money that you've made, like spend less than you make every single month. And then you want to make that money work harder for you than you worked for it. So those are like three super simple things. Uh, they're not easy, especially when you're breaking that habit. And so um, I think the trade-off, you have to figure out, okay, well, what's the trade-off that I'm going to do right now? Because in life, you, it, there is always the point of, I could work harder, I could work longer, I could work more, I could do something else, or I could spend this time doing the things that I want, which when I don't get paid for that. So I think that's what's hard is to figure out like, okay, is the trade-off worth it? Or should I spend time doing whatever I want right now? And it just depends on where you are in your life, right? You said we might have listeners 25 to 45. We might have listeners that are 15 or, or in their 70s or 80s. Like we have no idea. But it probably just depends on where you are in your life. Like how much do you want to work? What are your goals? And no one can really tell that to you but you. But this is why Bitcoin becomes super important. It's not just this hedge against inflation. It's a total it's a total uh, mindset change from uh, the fiat brain, the fiat mind, consume now, I'll pay for it later. And then it's just all these things, like you just keep getting big, like more and more credit. And I think that's where Bitcoin is like, is just this low, lower your time preference. I'm gonna work now. And then in the future, I will have a much better life than because I did a little bit of sacrifice right now. So that's kind of how I think about like, how do you exit this hamster wheel? It's not easy, first of all, like it's not easy. Everyone has to figure out their own way, but there is a way for every single person. No one's too far gone. Uh, no one has done so much that they'll never be able to make it out. That's how it feels though, when you're, when you're in this recurring hamster wheel. And so to get out of it, uh, you just have to take an honest look at yourself 
and you can't you can't be too easy on yourself and you can't be too harsh because if you're too easy you'll never make the right changes if you're too hard on yourself then uh then you'll you'll never have the confidence to get to get out of it yeah yeah that's absolutely true and i don't know for me especially like in 2018 2019 it started to daunt on me like, whoa, this Bitcoin thing could do like a 10x every four years. Yeah. You know, like obviously no guarantees. I completely realized that back then as well, there's no guarantees it's gonna do 10x or keep doing that. It could be diminishing returns, but I I specifically remember thinking to myself, like, oh my God, if this thing is real right then and there even though i just had a little bit of bitcoin saved i was like at some point if i hold on to this long enough i will be a millionaire yeah. and <laughs> it's crazy that was like that was a pretty significant moment for me because it just you know if you feel that you are a, a millionaire in this case or what is a millionaire right? but, but so, it, so has that point happened yet <laughs> <laughs> it it gives you hope and it, it gave you like a confidence and a hope that I didn't have before. It gives you something to hang on to. And I specifically remember telling my wife, I was like, even if Bitcoin goes to zero right now, I will never forget the way it's made me feel and the way it's made me change the way I look at life. You know, because once you know you're hanging on to something that's gonna be worth a lot in the future, then you automatically start I don't know, it's like this stress and this burden just falls off of you and you start thinking about, okay, well, if that's gonna happen, then what what would I really do with my time and my, my wealth at that point? What is it that I really wanna do? And what is it that I really wanna get out of life? And the funny thing is you kind of postpone those kind of thoughts when you are still stuck in the hamster wheel because you're like, yeah, yeah if I get a million, then I'm gonna do this and this and that. Then it seems easy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. It's it. Bitcoin has been like really profound in the way you look at life, and that's why I'm so convinced that it really will change the world for the better because it gives people peace. Like right now in the fiat world, where we're constantly being debased. So every time we make a little bit of money, they print so much more that they basically just dilute it and it's gone again. You know, so we keep having to run and run, or how Michael Saylor says, you know, like the oxygen keeps getting sucked out yes. of the room every time you think you can breathe a little bit less gone again and you're and you're like like panting looking for fresh air somewhere again you have to do your best if you if you have time to breathe yeah then you you don't have to like rush and race with each other you can actually you can see it i mean a lot of the bitcoiners who've been around for a long time they start doing the things they really want to they start farming you know, they start making art, they start writing, they they start helping friends and family. Um, so really, you know, not only to benefit themselves, I think everybody has this higher want or this higher goal to, to want to do good for the world or for their neighbors or for their friends and families. And it's just that our jobs are keeping us from it, right? We're so busy surviving and making that next paycheck that we don't get to do all those stuff that would actually benefit the world you know? yeah so, yeah yeah it, i i really believe that. i think that's very hopeful for the future of how bitcoin can at the same time i think naysayers would be like well not if we all uh, just get rich and we can't all just be uh sitting at home and doing nothing um, that's true <laughs> so yeah the people that start to I mean, that's how it's always been with anything though, right? Like anytime people have been able to figure out the new thing that's going to change the world, they, you normally benefit from that thing. If you, if you have the guts to put your money on it, like if you were, if you decided to invest in Apple stock or Amazon stock and it was super volatile at the beginning, uh, you if you held through those times and you realized how it was going to change the world, then you get rewarded for it. And so with like, if you don't put your money, if there's no skin in the game, you don't get rewarded for it. You might be able to call something out 
but it's different when when you actually have skin in the game. And so I think that's like putting skin in the game, putting money on the line, and then studying it, seeing if it works. Like, yes, did we get lucky? Are we getting lucky right now? Sure. But are we getting lucky when it drops more than 50% and we still hold on to our Bitcoin stack? We don't sell? Like, no, we've done the work on that. So like, there's a lot of different things uh, that are involved in all of this. And yeah, it's going to make the world better. Uh, should we get rewarded for that? Why not? Like, <laughs> who? If we didn't get rewarded, like if you do work, should you get uh, compensated for that work? Probably, like you should probably get rewarded for the work you do. I think everyone would agree. So if you've done the work for Bitcoin and and you've under, and you start to understand it and you put your you put your wealth in it, which is your energy, you should be rewarded for that. That only makes sense. Now, is everyone going to do that? No. Tech, like by definition, not everyone can be early. So only few will be early. And that's why we always say few understand. So, so, so the early ones will get like outsized rewards for this. I do want to say though, that even if the entire world has adopted Bitcoin, it would still make sense to put the time and uh, energy you put into work to still convert that into Bitcoin, because at least you're converting it into something that is a fixed share of that, you know, like whatever amount you're buying is that divided over 21 million Bitcoin, right? Well, yeah. if you put it in fiat, it's just your, your money divided into infinity. And I think honestly, if you, <laughs> especially that money that gets put aside into a 401k or some retirement plan, you're, you're putting like dollars away for like 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Um, let's, let's say you're working for, I don't know, uh, we have euros here, but let's, let's say you're working for like, I don't know, let's say $15 an hour or something. And you're like, ah. but if you actually calculate what $15 will buy you in 30 years, you'd be like, why am I even working for this? Like, there's no way I would work for so little per hour. Yeah. However, because it's so far out in the future and we cannot definitively say that it's going to be worth this little, we just think, oh, $15 right now, it sounds okay. I'm going to do this work for $15 an hour, but you're losing so much money over the long term. It's, yeah. uh, it's insane. And with Bitcoin, at least you know that, hey, any work you do now, right, is work that I don't have to do later. So if I work twice as hard now, then you know I'm I'm saving time from from my future self that I don't have to work, yeah. and in a fiat system that's completely not the case because even if you work double, triple, you know quadruple overtime right now, the inflation just sucks all that stuff away. That there's no way to transport that time savings over a period longer than thirty or forty years. It's just impossible. You have to put it then in in gold or in real estate or something that will actually <laughs> retain, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's share uh, out of a finite number. And that's why what makes Bitcoin so great alongside that we are early and it's still being adopted. So you get like these outside, outsized gains, but even if it's like fully adopted, it would still make perfect sense to, to keep it in Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I totally, it was a very good point that you made. Like once, Bitcoin, once we've gotten to a Bitcoin standard, it still makes sense to keep your money in Bitcoin because that's like the whole point of all this. There's no, there won't be any inflation. And that's what makes it where right now, if you have your job, you're in the hamster wheel. You're, you also have to be a full-time stock picker. You have to figure out, okay, well, what stocks do I invest in or what, or I need to, or you become like a real estate investor. Or I need to buy real estate with my dollars because my dollars are going to be worthless in 20 years from now or less. And so I think that's a huge point that you made. Even when we're on a Bitcoin standard, it'll still make sense to save in Bitcoin. And you won't necessarily have to do, you can go out and go out and buy stocks if you want with your Bitcoin or buy real estate, but it, it won't be, you won't be forced to do it because there won't be an increasing supply of Bitcoin forever and ever and ever. I think that's, that's like so important. That's the difference. Yeah, you gotta, 
and imagine that um, you know, as as we are a very uh, innovative and productive species, and we keep evolving as 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 humankind as well. You know, like throughout time, we keep inventing new technologies and making things more efficient and easier to do. Our GDP will keep growing, so the economic output or the you know what just keeps growing on the planet, and that is also captured in you know. <laughs> I'm considering a hyper Bitcoinized, hyper Bitcoinized world where we price everything in Bitcoin. If that's the case, and everybody's using Bitcoin, when the GDP of the world increases, or you know, the, the economic output goes up, that will also be reflected then in the Bitcoin price still going up. So it will be multiple reasons to 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 hold Bitcoin, even if everybody on the planet already uses Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. that's an argument a lot of people use yeah yeah you're just waiting for the next sucker to buy it you know so that for you to dump it on but that is so far from from the truth it's just way better money you know it's like warren buffett saying like even if i buy all the bitcoin who am i going to sell it to yeah you know i can make that argument for the us dollar as well you know, if you buy all the us dollars who are you going to sell it to that's not how money works that's just such a lame argument but sorry yeah, yeah i just <laughs> Yeah, dude. Uh, that's that's just the basis of it. How to how to so what do we learn? How how do you escape the hamster wheel? What what's the what's the, the final take, Marcus? Ooh, well, I'm still in the hamster wheel a little bit. I still do some <laughs> fiat mining. How are you escaping? Not- how are you escaping it? I actually, I, I actually go as far to say I did escape the hamster wheel because I quit my job like uh, last year. Okay. Um, started started freelancing, so that's really cool, you know. And um, being your own boss, uh, I, I already started my own business when I was twenty eight because back then already I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I realized working for a boss, you're not gonna get rich, right? I mean. You can, you can you can get you can get a raise, but there's always some ceiling, you know. So unless you own a business, or you you have this business idea that can scale, uh, that's how you're going to make the big bucks. Another another thing for me was like getting into real estate. I quickly realized that after buying my first apartment and then selling it a couple of years later, and just the price increase from the yes. real estate was so much more that I ever been able to save before that time it was like okay so you know and my parents used to say that as well it's like real estate is a really good deal so try to get you know don't be afraid of a big mortgage because yeah the more debt you have the 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 higher the number of your houses and if the house increases with 10 percent it's better to have an expensive house that increases with 10 percent than a small apartment you know so you got to be careful know, like, you make the payment. You got to be careful, obviously. But I'm just saying what I've been through on my journey. And then, like, it's obviously one thing is hearing it. But I remember, like, going for my first mortgage when I was in my 20s. And I was like, yeah. hundreds of thousands of euros. I was like, how am I ever going to pay this back? Right? <laughs> I because thought the I, same I thing. Can barely, I could barely save <laughs> up a thousand, a, a thousand euros at the end yeah. of the year. You know, like, So how am I ever going to pay that back? And then they, like... So that was pretty daunting, but then you know, once you have the mortgage and you realize you can pay the, the monthly, uh, uh, what do you call it in English? The monthly fees or the monthly um, mortgage, your mortgage. Yeah, the mortgage payment. Um, then it felt okay, and then when I sold it, it was like, whoa, you know, like okay, you know, like I I've been doing these payments, so I paid back part of the house, and now that it's sold for a higher price, you know, all of a sudden I have this really nice. <laughs> amount of money sitting on my bank account that I didn't have before. So that was really, uh, that was one step. And to get that mortgage here in the Netherlands, at least you need to have like a, a fixed job. So yeah. if you have a job, you know, with a contract, uh, like without an end date, basically, that you, then you get like into the area that you can get these kind of mortgages. So that was important. So it is important to to work and and be able to get that earning power to get that mortgage and then you know make moves i guess but you know for everybody it'll be different because one per- person will choose to 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 rent or wants to make their money in a different way or save it in a different way but i guess it is to have a goal to have a plan 
I guess it does also really help to understand. I noticed that a lot. I mean, my job is has always been working with numbers. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm a math guy. So for me, like calculating what like the the average uh, return per year is, uh, or looking at stock, you can have two gr graphs that that go from bottom left to top right that are going up. Yeah, and then I'll ask people like, which one of these two would you rather buy? And uh, option A doubled in price and option B like tenfolded in price. But then when I ask people this question, they have trouble reading the graph. And to them, the graph looks the same. While they both go up, one goes up 10 times faster than the other. And people really have trouble reading graphs, understanding numbers, you know. They're like, yeah, I'd rather just buy some stocks and then I'm going to get like 7% guaranteed, which is not true either. You know, like yeah. if you look at the average return on S&P 500, think, ah, oh, 7% saving, that sounds reasonable, not too risky. Uh, it's, it's also just like learning about that stuff and understanding and just make an Excel sheet and just pull down 30 years and fill in, you know, start with like $1,000. What happens to a thousand dollars if you get seven percent each year? Well, in year two, you're gonna have a thousand and seven dollars. And then in year three, you're gonna have a thousand and fourteen or fifteen dollars, you know? Yeah. And it seems to like not go fast at all. But then when you get past year twenty-five, all of a sudden you realize this thing is starting to take off. You know, it makes a big difference over 30 years. But we are all such high time preference people, especially when you're young, you know, like, oh my God, it's like a 30 year plan. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of elements to it. Bitcoin will do 7% in a day. So <laughs> the stock market looks so small. It's funny oh, because yeah. like, I remember when I was in, when, when I was like finishing up college, I was like 24, 25. And they're like, you need to get a, an IRA, open one up when you're 18. I'm like, dude, I already felt late, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> screw that. Then I'm like, I'm gonna look for something else. And uh, I think that's the way a lot of people look right now when they get into Bitcoin. Well, however old you are, whatever your situation is, you're not late to Bitcoin. So I this think this is also why the, this is also why the, why they will buy XRP at 50 cents. Yes, because, yeah. Oh, I missed the Bitcoin <laughs> boat. I need to get into these altcoins. Well, the altcoins are going to be are going to be worse off. And uh, this is this is like the whole thing is how do you how do you escape the hamster wheel? You grow your wealth while you sleep, right? You grow your wealth and it doesn't depend on your labor hours, on your manpower or woman power hours, whatever you want to call it on your manpower hours. It doesn't depend on your labor. You grow wealth while you sleep. And what's the best way to do that? Bitcoin is the best way to do that. That is the number one. And so you can get into you can get into anything you want. But as we're making this change from fiat to sound money, Bitcoin is the answer. And if you just save your wealth in Bitcoin over and over again, and we will beat this, this horse forever. This is the way to win. And, and honestly, like I'm never, I never stop being amazed about Bitcoin either. Like I yeah. can still make a comparison to like 1990s internet. I remember I was like in college then and coming out of college and just realizing like we just missed the entire dot com bubble, you know, like people were getting fabulously rich off like all these stocks shooting to the moon. And I was like, oh, I was, I was still in school. I, didn't, I had no idea this stuff was going on. And yeah. then like during my uh, working years, you know, I literally saw like how mobile phones came rolling out first with like the Nokia's and the Blackberries, And then later we got like the iPhones and we got apps and the iPads. And you see how f like things like Instagram, I remember when Instagram was like bought like for $1 billion, like three months after it was being founded, you know, like it was crazy. <laughs> And I, was, I kept feeling like, oh, I'm missing all this stuff and I'm not in Silicon Valley. And how do you even get part? You know, like, and now we are seeing like a similar type of technology, you know, how like the internet, like Sailor always talks about how it dematerializes the physical world. You know, yeah. like you used to have like a Rolodex on your table. That's now your phone, you know, yeah. your, your, 
everything just gets dematerialized into your phone. The only thing that hasn't yet is money, right? It's just been this archaic, ancient, analog system we still have. Even if it's like digital money, it's just in the background, it's still tied together with all these legacy systems. And Wow, this gonna, is just such fun. a massive leap forward. We're like right in it. You know, it's our time. It's here in front of you. You can grab it or not. This is going to be one of those things where you look back in 20, 30 years like, wow, I wish I bought Amazon back in 1998. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And it has so much more benefits than just that number go up. But that alone can <laughs> will excite most uh yeah, Man, and when, Bit and when Bitcoin right. hits a million, two million, five million, ten million, don't come to us and tell us and say why didn't why didn't you guys say anything? We've been saying it all along, so we've been saying it all along. We will continue to say it. We will not stop saying it. And stay away from the altcoin casinos. That's not. I would rather just go to a if you're gonna go to a casino, go to a physical casino. Don't go to the altcoin casino. I promise you have more fun hanging out at a real casino anyway. And you'll probably lose your money there too. But at least you'll get to roll some dice. <laughs> That's if you're going to go to the casino, you know, just use like a small, small percentage and don't put in more than you're willing to lose. You know, it's, um, I guess it's fine to speculate a little bit with like a percent or maybe 10% of your, your holdings. No. No, uh, I think I I think people will always have different like risk levels, right? And are you and, talking about the casino casino or the altcoin casino right now? The thing with the altcoin casino is that it's so damn unethical. That's what's really bothering me. I mean, we talked about this before the show too. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the guy. I, I feel bad though because I forgot his 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 Twitter handle. Who? Um, it's a guy from Ethiopia, I believe, and he shared um, this video. I believe he works for the government there and Charles Hoskinson's Cardano team yeah. showed up there like back in 2018 already saying that, you know, we're going to work with you guys on the blockchain and we're going to put agriculture on the black blockchain and then they worked on it for a couple of years and they never delivered any product because you cannot put agriculture on the blockchain because the map is not the territory anyway topic for a different episode right it's all yes. bs but all that is this these guys these scammers do is they they go to these countries they bribe a bunch of people just like what Roger Ver did in St. Martin they bribe local politicians to be able to say in their marketing PR we are working in Ethiopia with the government and the Ethiopians are using Cardano, right? And yeah. they'll use that to, to, to put on YouTube and to put all over the internet. So people are like, wow, this, this project has traction. It's, it's proving very promising for the future. They're doing great things in developing countries and make it a better world. And let's pump it, you know? And, like, and all that they're doing is they're wasting everybody's time, you know, especially in those countries... <laughs> where you know who, who could benefit the most from bitcoin right now they're just distracting them wasting their time and you know even like gambling on on coins like cardano you're you're prolonging and persisting these these scams mm. it was this guy right here cal casa correct that's was the one guy. yeah he um he has a great video he put up he seems yeah. like a really uh a uh, respectful guy, you know, who, who knows what he's talking about. So I could recommend everybody to check out that video from him. I don't know. I can't see the video right now what you're showing. Sean. No, this is just his, this is just his Twitter profile. But uh, yeah. if if you would scroll down through his uh, his his feed or his timeline, I'm sure you'd run into that yeah. video. Yeah, yeah. If you want, and he says for... that right now he's he's blocked by most of the Cardano community. So it just shows that how these people are just yeah. completely there for the shills. There's nothing, it's all air, you know, there's no real development going on there. It's all a marketing ploy to pump that Cardano number as high as they can. Yeah. And to so, just make an exit scam. So yeah, no, don't, please don't participate in the altcoin casino because you're doing more harm than you realize. You know, on a personal level, if you want to gamble and stuff, I don't care, you know, you do you, but you're actually doing a lot more harm than you realize by, uh, 
you know, by investing in these, in these shit points. So yeah. yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, exactly. That's, I think that's enough for today on that. Let's get into the news of the week. Uh, we got some, a lot of good news, some things that, that are pretty crazy. We're all used to Michael Saylor and he had Bitcoin for corporations. He's now had that twice. Uh, the last two Februarys, he did Bitcoin for corporations in February of 2021. Then he did it in February of 2022. Naibu Bukele is, <laughs> is he the, the Michael Saylor of presidents? That's the question. He tweeted yesterday, tomorrow, which is today, 32 central banks and 12 financial authorities, 44 countries, We'll meet in El Salvador to discuss financial inclusion, digital economy, banking the unbanked, the Bitcoin rollout, and its benefits in our country. Uh, then he named off every single one of those central banks or those uh, financial authorities from all those countries, some of which are Egypt, Jordan, Nigeria, Armenia. There was India, I think, was the biggest one. You know, so you had all of these countries coming today to El Salvador where Naib Bukele could just roll out the game plan. This is how this is how we switched to a Bitcoin standard. Uh, this is the benefits of it. And this is how you can do it. So uh, what do you think can happen from here, Marcus? Well, I've, I've seen some tweets about this and a uh, fun, fun fact is that during the Bretton Woods agreement, there were 44 countries wow. uh, there as well. So I don't know if that's like a coincidence, <laughs> but this could be, you know, the way the Bretton, Bretton Woods is remembered as the, the start of, you know, the, the, the current U.S. world reserve system. Who knows, this might turn into, you know, what, what we will look back at this day in, in 100 years from now. What do you think? Uh, I mean, yeah. when you when you look at the the forty four countries listed here, I mean, we're we're these are obviously not the G twenty countries. We're no. seeing countries like Sudan, Haiti, Madagascar, uh, Ghana, Egypt. Um, it a seemed of, to me a lot of African countries and yeah. some Latin American right. countries for sure. It seems like it's all a lot of countries who are right now either uh, with big loans from the IMF, yes, <laughs> either dollarized, um, their own currency is not very strong, and uh, it seems to me that the <laughs> use case for for Bitcoin uh, is the most obvious to them because um, if you have a weak currency. Yeah. And you're either dollarized and, um, you know, you don't benefit from dollars being printed. We've talked about this before. You're just being uh, debased and you're constantly struggling to keep up with a dollar and to get more dollars. So why not go into this fair system that the whole world is busy adopting? I don't know. To me, it feels I, this is this is the real signal, Sean, to me. Uh, yeah. It, it seems like this is how Bitcoin, this is how we're going to get there. We always said the U.S. would be the last, the U.S. and Europe would be the last to adopt Bitcoin, right? Because we don't see the need. If I ask people over here in the Netherlands, like, oh, what do you think about Bitcoin? Oh, why would I need it? You know, like they, they, they love the euro. It's all working very well. They don't see any need to change it. They, they're happy to have a central bank. They, they think the central bank is working for them. In these other countries, you don't have to explain <laughs> the same way as I have to explain here in the Netherlands to people. Uh, when I was in Belize, it was instantly obvious to the people like, oh, that would be great to get out from under the dollar. You know, obvious. It, uh, it's obvious. And so to these central bankers, I think it's obvious. And uh, I don't, I, wow, I, yeah, that's why I love Bitcoin, dude. This is, this is like every week, every day you can turn on Twitter and it's like this soap series unfolding in real time. And this is real world. And you can see like the real world adoption happening every day. And like 
news like this, it's just like huge moments, you know, and they, they, they keep popping up. So it makes me incredibly bullish and hopeful for the future. Yes. What about you? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I look at it. I look at it like uh, there's a lot of countries who, just like you said, they are underprivileged countries, countries that are struggling more or less financially or countries that are under the control of the IMF uh, or other organizations, or other countries that don't really care about their country. Um, and they say, oh, we're going to give you these loans and to make you to make your countries better. But in the long run, they've been these very poorly executed loans. They've actually added more control and taken away sovereignty from these countries because uh, they've they've taken away the financial uh, financial progression from these countries. So I look at it like this. There's a lot of African countries. Africa, uh, I think there's about 14 or 15 countries that currently use the CFA franc, which stands for the colonies Francaises d'Afrique, which I think is like the African French colonies, if you say that in English. Um, there's like 14 or 15 of them that are currently under control of France. And so to use something like Bitcoin, they get to become more sovereign because they, there's no one that controls Bitcoin. Uh, you know, to use Bitcoin in Latin America, uh, you get to escape the control of the IMF. So it's just all of these countries that are finally getting to, to become sovereign, truly sovereign. And, you know, a lot of them has probably been a grassroots effort starting from the bottom going up, not necessarily a top down. Even in El Salvador, you had Bitcoin Beach before Bukele ever did the Bitcoin standard over there. So I think the same thing may happen. But when you have someone like a president of a country that has been under control of the dollar and the IMF for years, uh, and he's coming to you as a president telling you, these are the benefits. I think a lot of people say, well, don't these leaders of these countries, and I think it's a very Western view too, to just think every leader of every country in a poor country is, is, is going to, to do only what's best for him. And maybe that's true. Maybe that's naive on my part. And maybe they stay with their local government currency because they can kind of finagle how they want, but they're still under control of someone above them. I think Bukele will talk to them and basically say, take pride in being sovereign, right? Take pride in, in being your own country for once. That's what Bukele is doing in El Salvador. He's taking pride in being from El Salvador and not being under control of the IMF, not being under control of the United States. And I think that is something big. If you're from a country that's under control of another country, because you owe them money or because of finances, wouldn't you want to get out of that control and become your own country? Could that provide you more power than, than you currently have? And I think it can. And I think that's just the same thing with anyone. Like This is what we've talked about the whole time, right? Financial self-reliance. And this is financial self-reliance on a nation state uh, level. So I think hopefully this is the message that Bukele is telling them. And hopefully they listen. And, you know, you never know how someone will adopt Bitcoin or why they'll adopt Bitcoin, but you hope that they do it for good reasons. Obviously, this is the world is not perfect. People aren't perfect. Politicians are far from perfect. So they're going to have their own self-interested views. And that should be known. Um, but what's great about Bitcoin is, first of all, Bitcoin doesn't care. And second of all, you can't print more Bitcoin. So it's not a proof of stake system where if you have more, now you can control more. Uh, anyone, if you buy 0 0.001 Bitcoin, or if you have uh, 100,000 Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. If you run your own node, uh, you, have, you don't have any less or more control than anyone else. And I think that's what's beautiful about Bitcoin and different from the fiat standard that we have. Those who have more money, those who are closer to the money printer, they make all the decisions, they have all the power, and they route the power back to themselves. And it's not truly free, it's controlled. And this is money 
uncontrolled, decentralized for nation states and people that are struggling. So I would love to see this. I would love to see these countries move to, to an adoption of Bitcoin and Bitcoin standard purely because I think I like the underdog stories and all of these countries. How, how ironic would it be, right? Like if like a new global way of working or doing finance is started by like these countries who are basically on the fringe of the system right now, right? And they're like now the ones kicking it off. That would be, oh that's, man. Yeah. That's that's stuff. Yeah. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. They, I think Najib even retweeted a picture already of where you see all the 44 country representatives sitting together in one picture. <laughs> and somebody's made a, a, a how it's going and uh, how it started. Uh, and they put laser eyes on all the, <laughs> yeah. on everybody's eyes. That was pretty funny. But yeah, I would love to be a fly on the wall because at the same time, your point is completely right. They are politicians and they are central bankers. So, um, you know, Najib is luckily somebody who deeply deeply understands bitcoin you know he do, he's not just like i heard about bitcoin i'm going to try to adopt it no you can tell the guy has put in like all the thousands of hours yeah. of work in understanding bitcoin so those guys over there are in good hands to be orange pilled by energy because i think if there's anybody he could probably do it but it won't be easy for him because these are still central bankers. They're going to be like, but shouldn't I create my own coin or how can we still do monetary policy? You know, they're, they're hardwired to think like that. So yeah. we shouldn't get like too overexcited either because, <laughs> but it's a, it's a great start. It's a great yeah. Start. It's a great start. And you know, we all, a lot of us, you know, going the alt altcoin route before Bitcoin, so maybe these countries try that. They look like that's what you were talking about with that Cal Casa guy from Ethiopia. They tried Cordano, Cardano, whatever it's called. Uh, and they realized that it's just vaporware. It's just, it's a lot of promises. Nothing actually gets solved. It's a solution looking for a problem. And now they don't like it anymore. So I think that's just like another and then and then they go okay well maybe this bitcoin thing is actually real and then they fall further down the the, the rabbit hole and understand more so this could be really good um more news today bitcoin magazine uh tweeted and, and there was an article um i like bitcoin magazine so we'll just uh, look at their tweet it said luna foundation guard confirmed on monday morning that it had sold over 80,000 Bitcoin over the past week to acquire UST in an attempt to defend its crumbling US dollar pig. From, and the report was from Namcios. So uh, this, is, this is, imagine, this is what you and me were talking about earlier too. Imagine selling 80,000 Bitcoin to prop up your altcoin. Could, I couldn't even, I couldn't imagine doing something like this. Like, what, what's the point it's of doing that? I don't know. Short answer is I don't know. I mean, they, they bought that 80,000 just like a couple of weeks ago, right? So, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, this, this whole Luna story is unfolding. I don't know the details behind it. It's an algorithmic stable coin. Uh, which was apparently flawed from from its inception. Um, uh, I think it's suspect AF. <laughs> if I see a Novogratz putting like a big big tattoo on his arm with Luna on it, a couple months before this whole thing collapsing, why does a multi billionaire put a big tattoo of a venture? he's in on his arm that means he's that means that venture changed his life you know i.e he got a ton of money out of this probably millions billions whatever yeah here's his tattoo right? i mean how gross is this you know <laughs> and and a couple of weeks after putting this tattoo we see a complete rug pull of the entire project trillions of dollars sorry not trillions billions of dollars of market cap just erased you know people who had 
for whatever reason, holding stable coin USDT on their exchange, they come to the exchange to find their money is gone, you know? While Mr. Novogratz over here is sitting at home with his big ass tattoo and his billions of dollars on his bank account. I don't know, dude. It just seems like such a crazy place right now where like such obvious scams and uh, where people are like promoting these projects rug pulling you know like taking out billions of money out of these projects and then having the projects collapse um i made a meme about this i couldn't help myself it's very upsetting uh, i i talk better through my memes i think than, than, than the words on here but it's yeah. just disgusting right like this the, like this tattoo is disgusting it it's just as this guy like, I just think, how did this tattoo even come about, right? Did Do Kwan, the creator of Terra and Luna, know, <laughs> know we, that, that he had the to keep point it tattoo? Nice, right? What? I said, I know we try to keep it like a little decent. <laughs> it's like the biggest tramp stamp you could get. Right? Yes, this is like, this is tramp stamp times 100. Like, this guy is, it's, it's scam stamp. This is a scam stamp is what it is. The dude gets a tattoo what? of a scam on his arm. He probably got paid very, he definitely got paid very handsomely to get this tattoo. You don't just get a tattoo of some altcoin that rug pulls four or five months later and not get paid for that, especially being Novogratz and Galaxy Digital, which he runs. It's just, it's just disgusting. To me it's really disgusting and the thing is you know this guy gets invited on like cnbc all the time you know all the all time these, on Yahoo, talk on all these, he's this talking head he's this american billionaire investor but they're all scammers you know like there's no ethos there like these guys this guy knows very well okay there's this bull run coming you know we're going to invest in some of these altcoin projects there's going to be all kind of new entrants into the space if we do the marketing right we can, you know, like we can make this, we can make these new coins moon incredibly, you know, with like my access to media and yada, yada, yada. And that's literally what they do. They just create this monster, billions of market cap, and then just be like, ha ha, they suck the money out of it and watch it collapse and just like, yeah, rug pull thousands and thousands of, of, of people. and. Look, I don't feel sorry for those people either because, you know, do your own frigging research. What are you thinking? You think you're just going to get rich by buying some stupid project or investing into something you have no idea what it is. Well, that's why we're here. Time, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Uncle we're Sean, here. Uncle Marcus are here to tell you. Watch I'm, out. I'm not going to I'm not going to make you scammer. feel better about losing money because you had money in USDT. You're an asshole. You're a dumbass for for even holding <laughs> money in that if you didn't know what it was. Yeah. And at the same time, the way these guys operate and the way they're still being invited on to shows as and people pretending that this is all new tech and this is an innovative space and it's all part of the game risks and and whatnot. Sure, partly true, but in my mind this is shady AF. <laughs> it's shady, dude. He, he does it. Yeah. Raul Powell does it. Oh my all God. these dudes are doing it. It's all these guys that they didn't accomplish what they wanted to accomplish in the VC world. They figured out that they could scam people in crypto, and now they're doing it. And it's just that's why to me it's disgusting because it's like it's dude, disgusting. And then they and then chance. they go after Bitcoiners too. They'll, they'll say like, oh, you Bitcoin maximalist and there's a bigger world than Bitcoin out there. But yes. it turns out every time again, no, it, they're just like ordinary scams. You know, it's just. And this is the thing, like they had a chance to, to, to be Bitcoin only. And instead they decided to join a side that essentially attacks Bitcoin. And because if you have an altcoin, you are saying, Bitcoin doesn't do X, Y, and Z, and they're lying about it because Bitcoin does do the things that they say that it doesn't do. Like this guy right here, uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Uh, let's pull this All up right. real quick too. That's another one. So this dude, right? FTX billion, billionaire chief says Bitcoin has no future as a payments network. 
right? He goes, Bitcoin's the world's largest cryptocurrency uh, is created. Gosh, let me do this real quick. So cryptocurrency exchange FTX's founder has said that Bitcoin has no future as a payments network and criticized the digital currency for its inefficiency and high environmental costs, the Financial Times reported on Monday. Bitcoin, the world's largest cryptocurrency, is created by a process called proof of work that requires computers to mine the currency by solving complex puzzles, more or less. Powering these computers needs large amounts of electricity. An alternative to the to the system is called proof of stake network where particip participants can buy tokens that allow them to join the network the more tokens they own the more they can mine ftx founder and chief executive sam bankman fried told financial times that proof of stake networks would be required to evolve as a payments network as they are cheaper and less power hungry so uh just one more thing bankman fried said he didn't believe Bitcoin had to go as a cryptocurrency, and it still may have a future as an asset, a commodity, and a store of value like gold. So just another grifter, another guy who, this guy owns FTX, which is a, a crypto exchange, like a Coinbase or a Gemini or any one of these things, where they sell Bitcoin and then they sell you an array of altcoins. And so it's just another grifter who the only way he's making more money is if he can get people to buy stupid crypto coins. And so when they're buying those things, he gets a percentage off of it. So he has to go out and say, oh, well, Bitcoin is, doesn't, isn't good as a payments network. But he doesn't even mention the Lightning Network. Like, he doesn't even touch it in the whole article. And so how how do we think that these people are experts if they don't even talk about the lightning network and they're and they're incentivized to not talk about it they're incentivized to not incorporate the lightning network to their platforms either because they can because as they do that and then people will realize bitcoin is already robust as a payments network and it's ready it's just that more and more uh merchants need to understand what Bitcoin is, need to adopt it. And as that happens, uh, we're going to see a huge shift in Bitcoin going from a store of value to a medium of exchange. And why would you, like, I just think about it. Why would you want to use something like a Luna as your medium of exchange when you could use the dollar as a medium of exchange, right? Like it, there's already government currency that inflates and you can already use that. So it doesn't make sense. Like that's the whole thing is you already have fiat that we use currently as a medium of exchange. So why would I need to use uh, fiat just because it's it's branded as cryptocurrency? It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I think the guys like Sam Bankman Fried, like Rao Powell, like Mike Novogratz, they're going to go down in history as grifters, as scammers, and they shouldn't be looked at as people to get information from. They should be looked at as disgusting because they are. Yeah. And what's frustrating is they make so much money off these projects. You know, we just talked about Cardano. It's just vaporware. They literally go out of their way, spend money to, to, to waste people's time in countries that, you know, like need help the most. They don't yeah. spend it on actual helping the countries. No, it's just about prolonging their Ponzi and promoting their Ponzi. And, and these guys, these owners of these exchanges, they make a lot of money. You know, every time somebody buys uh, any trading pair, they take their 1% or their 2% or their 0.5%, whatever it is, they make tons and tons of money. Not even to mention the deals they make with these new coins, you know, to be able to list a new coin. You know, like if, if, I, would, if I was like a scam artist and I create... A Bitcoiners guide coin, right? And yeah. we're like going to an exchange, and we can get it listed on like uh, on an exchange like FTX or or Binance. Then, who just yeah. having it listed is going to be huge, right? Yeah. So these exchanges also make big bucks from all these these token guys. You know, like well, if you want it listed, you know, you're gonna have to pay me a million bucks, or who knows what they have to pay? Maybe a million is just like a drop in the in the ocean. What the what these guys are asking, so. Your whole business model is they're making so much money off of this. And then in turn, taking those profits 
into making even more elaborate scams, into to paying Novogratz to put a big ass tattoo on his ass, and you know, getting Bill Clinton and Tony Blair to come to the Bahamas where this, yes. this Bankman Freed guy is to come to his conference. You know, yeah, these guys are making so much money off of scams, and then they use that money to to legitimize themselves, right? And it's like this. Then the media is like, oh, this guy is so successful. He's like such a, a wealthy entrepreneur in the crypto space. You know, he's somebody we need to listen to. No, these guys are the biggest crooks out there, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> it's like you and me huddling our little Bitcoin. Dude, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like a David and Goliath, to be honest. But uh, ultimately, I believe the truth will win. You know, people, especially, that's why... You got to love bear markets in Bitcoin, right? I mean, Bitcoin is tanking more than 50%. And what's happening to the alts? All these projects who are saying we are better than Bitcoin and we're going to flip Bitcoin and Bitcoin is old tech. You see at moment like this, it's all Bitcoin, people. If Bitcoin is going down, all these shit coins, I'm sorry, altcoins are going down. You know, it's... It's all tethered to Bitcoin. It's I, I still like the the meme where you see like this motorboat pulling a water skier. You know, all the water skiers behind the boat are the altcoins. The minute Bitcoin slows down, they don't have nothing pulling driving them forward. You know, they're gonna sink <laughs> the minute Bitcoin yes. stops. That is literally what the altcoin space is. And yeah, the more people that experience the bear market, the more people that will realize, hey, wait a minute. You know, Bitcoin is really what's driving this space and the rest is just uh, is just noise. They have all these nice promises, but it's all empty promises. Yeah. And what's an altcoin? So, anything, anything that's not Bitcoin. Even yeah. including your even including whoever your favorite altcoin is. Anything that's not you Bitcoin. You see these discussions on Twitter, Sean. Like you, you see people like really, really confidently saying these Bitcoiners they really don't understand crypto if they think that Bitcoin is like the only thing out there. I turn it around and be like, you really do not understand Bitcoin if you think there is innovation in altcoins because there really isn't. No. And all they keep referring to, all these exciting and promising technology. Well, name one, you know? It's, if, if anything... It's nothing, there's nothing there, literally nothing. If anything is developed on any of these altcoins, it'll just get that is of use. It'll just get developed on Bitcoin. It's that simple. Because Bitcoin, or you don't need, has or you don't need blockchain to solve it, you know? or you, or it'll be centralized, right? It'll be better yeah. if it's centralized than decentralized. And there's a lot of things that are better centralized. Money is best decentralized. But I think what's just disheartening about all of this is you know i i feel personally like i learned things from when i first started from guys like novogratz or rao pal or whoever and it's just disheartening because or disheartening not disheartening it's disheartening because of uh you just think these guys had an opportunity to be bitcoin only and they didn't and they scammed and they decided that it was better to scam noobs like you and me than to actually promote something that was good and of use. And so it just makes me fight harder. Like, screw these guys. I hate them. I really hate these guys because they don't have a heart and they're going to scam forever. So I'm going to play the opposite side and I'm going to push what's right as long as I can. So I think that's the biggest thing for me I don't care about your stupid scam because it doesn't because it's it's going to make people lose money. It's going to make a few rich and it doesn't change anything. It's not going to help a country in Africa that's under France's control. It's not going to help a country in Latin America that's under the control of the IMF. It's not going to help these poor people that I've lived with when I was in Honduras. They were living with tin roofs that had dirt floors, you know, and that, that had literally no money. Bitcoin will help. And that's the difference is we're not just living in Europe and the United States. There's a ton of third world countries out there who need Bitcoin. And yes, Europe and the United States will benefit too, but so will these other countries. And they will be able to get out of the poverty that they're in. 
And I think that's just so big and such a big thing for humanity that we haven't even thought fully through and we can't think it fully through because we don't know what Bitcoin can really give us until we're 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch this play out. And I'm going to push as hard as I can for Bitcoin because I think it really does make a, a difference for humanity. While I think the altcoin sphere is just a bunch of scammers trying to enrich themselves and they're not making the world any better. They're making it worse. Yeah. And if you're if you're at home, you know, and maybe you have like allocated some to Bitcoin and some to like different altcoin projects, then just get it out seriously. Like even from like an ethical perspective, just get it out. Like these 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 guys are like busy with such destructive <laughs> projects. And and at what point are they going to rug pull? And you know, like are you seriously think anyway? I think yeah. I said enough. I think that's good for uh, for this episode of Bitcoiner's Guide. We got a little deep. Now, right? now I feel like like I'm I'm like all angry. <laughs> I'm angry, but I'm I'm motivated, to, dude. I'm motivated to, yeah. to just push harder. Dude, I'm Bitcoin motivated. Is, is, is hope and like you know? Yes. At, at the same time, I feel like we. It's like all these altcoins and all this fud. It it feels like we're constantly fighting off negative stuff instead of like spending our time on like all the positivity that Bitcoin has to bring, right? Like there's so many pods yeah. and that's what's really bugging me about the media as well. You know, like they're being so intellectually dishonest, you know, like they're just focusing on all these negative talking points while nobody, no mainstream media has ever entertained the idea of what if Bitcoin is going to be like the world currency of the future and it's an open and fair system to everyone you know, like what could the benefits be of Bitcoin? I've never seen any story like that. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I All actually right. remember <laughs> Corey Clifton wrote a good article about that. If anyone did want to read, we should maybe talk about that sometime too. Which, which but yes, Bitcoin is hope. And uh, I believe in a bright orange future. I think uh, Bitcoin's going to win because it's truth. And the truth will always win. So uh, this week, we have NVK, one of the smartest Bitcoiners and creator of the cold card. He joins the Mean Factory podcast, the live stream that we do on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Do not miss this episode. And also remember uh, what you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, don't just let it stay here. Please share, like, and subscribe. Uh, as for Bitcoiner's Guide, episode 13 from Plan Marcus and Big Sean, we're over and out. Peace.